Saturday, March 21st. It is another beautiful day in New Jersey, and it is another day of uh, social distancing and uh, doing what it takes to try and uh, get this coronavirus to go away. And so we're taking advantage of the time to be able to catch up with people uh, who we don't get the chance to really catch up with all that often. And today, it's my buddy, Nick Melillo. What up? What's up, man? How we doing, brother? You know what? Not too bad. Now, you are, are you in Nicaragua? I am in Esteli, Nicaragua. And how is it? Everything is tranquilo, man. Tranquilo. Is, Good to hear. kind of calm right now. You know, we got some recorded cases here for the first time. Are they in uh, Esteli? Um, Esteli, I think they reported like a couple. Managua, I think there's like 25, 30 reported total in Nicaragua right now. Yeah. Um, but I mean, overall, people are kind of, kind of calm. Um, yeah. You know, people have gone through a lot down, down in Nicaragua. So I don't, I think the perspective of dealing with it is probably a little different. Um, I don't know, man. It's interesting times. There's when did you, how long have you been down there? I've been down here for um, weeks now, since uh, end of end of February, I think. So really, like since since we did the event, you, it must have been pretty much after that, right? Pretty close. Correct. Yeah, I think uh, when I flew down here, it was sort of starting to kind of outbreak there in the states. So yeah, uh, yeah, it's been interesting. There was zero cases for the longest time, and just about three days ago, I think was the uh, three four days ago was like the first case. Um, and, and do you think that is is because it's just getting there, or just because testing and and availability yeah. to confirm? Yeah, pretty availability. I know the flu in general, man, was hitting hard down here in November, December. Anyway, I mean. Um, so yeah, I don't know how they're confirming cases or how, you know, if they have testing abilities or what. Yeah. Uh, um, so it's going to be interesting to see how things unfold, man. How are you how, doing over there? Um, you know what, man, we, we closed on, um, on Monday, we closed everything. Yeah. So we were, we were ahead of the, of the mandatory closings. Um, but the governor had asked for voluntary closings for non-essential, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, our people are the most important, whether it's our customers, employees, everyone. And, you know, what's the what's the point in risking and adding to the population density, you know, for for what? I mean, it's just no there's no return on that type of thinking. So, yeah, you know, we we closed um, on Monday. Um, so those of us that have real, you know, more sort of administrative and office type work, we're all working from home. Sure. Um, trying to support our retailers as best we can, you know, as they kind of uh, adjust to doing business. And then, um, you know, the store team, we're, we're, we've got them kind of hunkering down and trying to do some learning, working on their um, uh, certified retail tobacconist certifications for those who haven't. Sure. Um, you know, trying to keep everyone as busy and educated and inspired as possible. Yeah, man, that's but help me, obviously. That's that's the best thing I guess we could do right now is just keep productive, active, and uh, not let all this uncertainty uh, spiral yeah. further out of control. I mean, you know, because so, your your chances. I don't know. Yet again, I'm not a medical uh, professional at all. I, you know, the way I kind of keep my mind at ease right now. I know it's spreading, but. You know, thank God the mortality rate is not, you know, half the population or something like that. I mean, I, I think if, if we didn't, I think there there it could be argued that um, some of the reporting is, is a little over the top and that there is a little bit of panic. But at the end of the day, if we didn't have the panic, then people wouldn't take it seriously. And if they didn't take it seriously, they wouldn't stay home. And if they didn't stay home, this thing would just keep going. So, yeah. Like I was actually, I was just talking to my wife about this. I'm I'm okay with the panic, and because it makes people take it seriously, but at the same time, just for my own sanity, 
I'm trying to better understand the reality of the virus and understand the reality of how it transfers. You know, like I, I'm in my backyard right now. If someone tested positive half a block away, it is not going to somehow, you know, these, these droplets are not going to magically travel through the air half a block and somehow end up in my nose. I don't think. I don't, I don't know. I, again, I'm not a medical professional, but based on what I've seen with the, the, the amount of global cases, you, you would think it would be even at a higher rate if that was yeah. true. Especially in populations where you have, you know, China, India, Vietnam. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So I, I think all of these dramatic measures everybody's taking, I mean, it should prove to be uh, having an incredible impact um, as far as quelling this. And I like to think that we're doing our part here because we're not sitting face to face uh, next to each other, smoking cigars, breathing on each other. I don't have any of your droplets on me. You don't have my droplets on you. We are doing this through true social distancing, right? As far apart as possible, which I think is fabulous. Hey, I needed a break. So I got to tell you, I started this on Wednesday, um, and we did it with Pete Johnson on Wednesday, Tony Gomez on Thursday, nice. um, Matt Booth yesterday, you today, um, and you're probably going to be the last cigar guy for a while, and I'm sure. going to start um, just working in other folks sort of in, the, in my social circle of networks and friends that I just, you know, I would typically see in the course of a week or a month, and you bump into and you check in with, and... And this really isn't letting us do it. So the whole point of these has really been to, to just check in with folks, make sure they're doing well, and also take advantage of the time for me to get to know stuff about you that maybe I didn't know, and maybe you the, the, the same. Um, so, you know, some, I got a little feedback that, um, that people wished yesterday Matt and I talked more about cigars and actual tobacco, but I feel like there's so much stuff out there with good information about cigars and tobacco from you, from Matt, from other sources who do that, um, that I, I really want to kind of keep this a little more personal and one-on-one. -on -one. And sure. granted, we have an audience, and so maybe a little later on we'll, we'll open up for some, for some questions. But, um, but really, me. you know, um, I thought this would be cool just to learn a little more about you. And, and I'll tell you the area specifically. So, Obviously, what was it? A month or so ago, we had you in the store. We did a great event together. What an um, event, bro! It was so what good. What an event, man! It was so good. We I'm had what seventy feeling. seventy people, something like that. Seventy five people. We great. drank amazing gin, smoked your cigars. It felt good. It was like one of those really feel good events. You were a true MC, man, master of ceremonies, because it's impressive. Impressed. Well, it, was, it was great. It was good people. But so we kind of went through your history there. And I was thinking maybe just for the benefit of people who don't know all of it, I blazed through just like in the Reader's Digest version of, first of all, you're from Connecticut. I'm from Connecticut. That makes us slightly cooler than, I'd say, the rest of those folks from the other 49 states. Um, not by a significant degree, of course, but I, I would say... A, a measurable and that's of course because of our our cigar tobacco capabilities there in connecticut i think that part actually then really ladders it up to Next level. to a different level um but you started in retail around you were 18 right yeah uh, i was 19 was august 96 yeah uh, you were 19 19 in boston uh -huh. then you started with drew estate in 03 yep right Yep. Uh, I started with Davidoff in 02. Um, and then 03, you moved to Nicaragua. March of 03, yeah. yeah. And you basically stayed there 11 years. I mean, you stayed through to 2014. Yeah, yeah. The majority of my time has still been down there over the past here, down 17 years. You know, now starting the company five years ago, it's been a lot of back and forth. Um, but and yeah. You started, you started Foundation in 14, right? So we launched. No, we launched at the trade show in July of 2015. So I, I left Drew Estate May 9th, 2014, 
and then sort of spent that year in development, working on tobacco projects. So and we talked then, about it at, at the event, but I remember the, the, after you left Drew and before you started Foundation, you and me and your sister, we all went out for lunch in the city. We were at um, Morell's. Well, actually, my friend Anna Christina is literally live right now um, doing, a, doing something like this about wine. Uh, but she helped us pick some great wines that afternoon. And you were talking about doing something great and doing something different and on your own. It wasn't all like totally lined up, but I know you were talking about it. Yeah. But I remember spending a lot of time at that conversation, really, really learning so much more about you and your tobacco work and the Drew Estate work and like stuff that I didn't know. But the piece that like left out at me that I never really got to drill in on and I want to yeah. is – after you graduated high school, um, well, I guess then you went you went to college after high school, right? Yeah. So my mom worked at uh, Quinnipiac University in Hamden, Connecticut, and um, I was fortunate. She worked there since you know, I think '87, and my mom and dad sort of set it up that way, you know, um, to ensure that we would get an education and not have to, you know pay hundreds of thousands of dollars. So she actually ran the post office at the university I went for. And that enabled me, my brother and sister to, to go to school for basically Dude, nothing. That is serious long-term planning. Yeah, really. And I mean, my dad, my dad has had the foresight, you know, for that, just seeing the school prices and, um, you know, wanting education being important to both of them. Um, yeah, it was definitely because of his foresight, my mom's foresight, and, you know, she yeah, that's, worked. That's amazing. She didn't really work the greatest job, you know, but it was, um, she was sort of the lifeline of that, that school for the longest time because the post office was, like, in the center of campus. And, um, yeah, so I started. So your, your undergrad at Quinnipiac, what did you study? International business and sociology as a minor. And then – then you traveled? Yeah. So, like, yeah. So, I, the, literally the same week I started working uh, the Calabash Shop, which is an amazing cigar shop in Hamden, Connecticut, um, that my grandfather had been purchasing pipe tobacco there since the 70s. Two ladies ran the shop. This, that August uh, 1996, and I started school that, that same week that I got hired um, you know, working for the cigar shop. So at that time, you know, I was really discovering a lot of things just about life. You know, I was always asking those, those questions about just life in general, you know, at an early age, death, you know, why are things the way they are? Um, I was exposed to traveling because of my, my father and, and mother took us to Italy when we were like 13, 14. And that just blew my mind. So I knew I was dying to get out of Connecticut, um, and I spent all four years studying. I wasn't really into the partying scene and yeah. to spending my money on, on drinking every weekend, so I was working the shop and literally, like, sticking money under my mattress for four years. And when I graduated, um, I, I, I left to Europe, so I moved to Rome in uh, 2000, summer of 2000. And then I started work. That year was the Grand Jubilee with the Vatican. So you had millions of pilgrims coming from across the globe, descending on Rome. So I worked with the Vatican at different like holy sites, basically just helping pilgrims. So did um, you have that gig from here? Did, did you go for that gig or did you get there and figure it out? So I, get, I went through, uh, again, a, a family friend because um, in New Haven you have um, – the Knights of Columbus. So they were very involved in Rome. So there was a lot of family uh, friends to my mother and father that actually like lived in Rome. So they, they hooked up to connect. And then my plan was to do that for a time. And then I knew Ziggy Marley and the Melody Makers were on their tour of Europe um, also. So I ended up doing that work for a time, and then I took off with a Eurorail pass and uh, basically followed Ziggy Marley and the Melody Makers around Europe for 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 a while, which was okay. cool because it ended up being their last tour. 
Oh. So that actually was one of the questions I wanted to ask you, but yeah. I was going to save it, but now I'm not because it's starting to intersect. So you were in Italy working for the Vatican. Yeah. Uh, this is before you came back to work on a master's, which was Renaissance art. Correct. Which well, I no, assume... the, master's, the master's was, no, no, I, it wasn't for Renaissance. I wish it was for Renaissance art. It was for international business. And then I switched into doing uh, teaching. I was thinking about becoming a history teacher there for a while. So I was starting to kind of work on that. But yeah, that, that your... comes later after this so trip. Yeah. what is the connection to Marley and reggae and all of that because I, I assume that came later, but, but if that was already so important that while you were already in Italy, you were trying to line up this tour, yeah, then no, that, that go backwards and, and reconnect those dots on the, on the reggae so, Marley. So 96, I graduate high school. So again, you know, you're in the school system for so long. And here I was in 96 in the summer. And, you know, all of a sudden you're out of this system you've been in for all your life. So the question started even more. So there was a, a few things that were happening sort of randomly at the same time. My love for cigars was huge. A lot of the cigars that I loved at the time were all being made in Kingston, Jamaica. So okay. Super Factory, said, right? um, May Penn was where the Royal Jamaica factory. So I love Jamaican cigars. I love, you know, I was all in on the cigar side. My brother at one point had gotten a, a CD at Circuit City. I'll never forget it. Um, you know, our rooms were next to each other. And I remember him playing Bob Marley legend, No Woman, No Cry, the live version from the other, uh, from, his, from his room. And I was like, what is that? And then two of my friends happened to really just get into roots reggae. And then, you know, I heard. So I've this heard, is all, this is post high school. This is post high school. This is post high school, in, yeah. In college, working yeah. at Calabash, you got turned on to reggae through your brother's wall and was like, yeah. and what is this? Yeah, and two close friends of mine who just really got into reggae and Rasta and just like the whole culture. And then I started just reading, you know, a, it, it started connecting the dots for me about a, a lot of things in life. And... um yeah, so I just started getting into really the history. What what was Bob Marley, you know, talking about? I never drank at this time, never smoked weed, you know, and I started listening to what Bob was saying. And it's, you know, I compare Bob to like a Martin Luther King or a Malcolm X or, um, and then uh, it's really diving into history, which gets into, you know, Ethiopia, which is, you know, up about Ethiopia. Did I lose you? Are they going to kick us out of this or something like that? No, you're there. I was, I think you froze, but now um, you're back. So, yeah, all these things started happening. And then when I discovered Bob, it was like Bob became my best friend. Like his music. And I, I, I think I listened to Bob Marley for like at least three years straight. From like 96, 97 to you know, leading up to 2000. So, you know, by the time I went traveling, so in 1999, the summer of my senior year, good friends of mine that I grew up with were hitchhiking the West Coast of the United States. They left for two years, they hitchhiked all over the place. That was what year? Uh, this is like 98, 90, 98, so you 97, were, you were 98. Two years out of high school. Two you years, 20 years old. My best friends growing up were hitchhiking. I'm in school. We come to the summer of 99. It's August. I'm, where are we going to meet up? Let's meet up. I'm out of school. The cigar shop gave me some time off. So I drove cross country and we said, where are we going to meet? We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have social media. Okay. We're going to meet the night before Ziggy Marley and the Melody Makers play at Truckee, California. So I drove all the way across country. Arrived what did you drive? In, what's that? What did you drive? It was my friend's Pathfinder. Chris Dilmuth is his name. We both uh, we camped out across the way, and we arrived to Truckee, California the night before the concert. We camped out in the woods, uh, illegally, of course. We all didn't have much money. 
So we snuck out. It was it was so freezing that night. You know, I'm thinking August, California. I had a fleece sleeping bag. I think I almost got frostbite that night because I couldn't I couldn't feel my feet. When the sun rose that morning, I could feel every ray coming across the you know the horizon from your toe to your ankle like just all the way every... up and we couldn't we couldn't light a fire because we were camping illegally so if we had the fire we would have gotten caught so the sun rises that morning it's like you know 6 a.m we didn't have anything to do let's go to the the venue the venue was an outdoor amphitheater in Truckee, california so we had a soccer ball went kicking the ball around around noontime i see off in the distance the bus come so this big huge tour bus so like, guys guys the bus is coming the bus is coming so we walk over to where the bus was parking and we were just kicking the ball around outside the bus and then out walked ziggy steven marley julian marley damien julian really? Dong marley and then all the grand were there kids. other people or was it just no, you guys just, kicking a ball on them. So they come out and see the soccer ball. The kids, Bob's grandkids were there too. There was a bunch of kids. And then all of us just start kicking the ball around. We end up playing soccer from like 12, 1 o'clock in the afternoon until like 8 o'clock. So people were walking into the venue as we were playing. It was totally unfair because all the Barley brothers were on one team. And then it was like <laughs> me and my friends in the band on another Exhausted team. Exhausted and frozen. Yeah, so that was the first encounter. We played for, for hours, and then Stephen, Stephen Marley um, ended up giving us all access. So we watched the, the concert from backstage. You know, we were, we were just on the, you know, feeling on top of the world. And we hung out until, like, you know, 2, 3 in the morning on the tour bus. And um, that was sort of the first connection. So when I ended up, you know, uh, a year, year and a half later, going to Europe and then they see me like you know what are you doing here well so hold on so were you able to maintain because 96 97 99 even at that yeah. time it was much more difficult to really like stay in touch with someone yeah compared no. to how it is today so yeah. when you saw him in Europe were you guys in touch or did you just no, show no. up again I just showed up again and and he he like snapped yeah. the dots together like oh my they, gosh what are you doing here yeah, and then Bob's daughter Sadella, which is his first child, rec you know, remembered me. And then one of their singers, uh, Erica Newell, who we're we're really close uh, to this day, she they saw me, so you know they're like, "What are you doing here?" And then I would show up at the next concert. By the second concert that I showed up to, they would just let in, me in Europe. In Europe, they would just let me backstage and just let me, you know, watch the. Sh watched the show from the stage a lot of times. And um, yeah, it was just, you know, dream of a lifetime to to be able to travel and tour with them. Yeah. And so so that connection really has stayed with you. It's so it's it's not so much about the music. It's really way deeper. It's cultural. It's it's mindset. It's it's all that. It's everything. Yeah, it's really deep for me because it opened up a world to understanding human history and I really started getting into, um, you know, again, human history and where we all come from. And if you look at it, it's pretty convincing evidence that we all have one common root, and that is Ethiopia. So whether you go science, sci the thing that really blew my mind is, you know, if you read the Bible, whether you read it religiously or just as, as text, it describes the physical location of the Garden of Eden. So... It describes the four rivers of the Garden of Eden, one being Tigris and Euphrates, and which we know is modern day Mesopotamia, Iraq. The other two rivers were Gihon and Fihon, which it says in the Bible. So the Gihon flew through the land of some Bibles say Cush, other Bibles say Ethiopia. Cush is Hebrew, Ethiopia is Greek. They mean the same thing. Those who have been darkened by the sun. So I read that, and then at the same time, I'm randomly reading National Geographic that all of the first hominid species in Homo sapien bones have been discovered in this same region. So I kind of started seeing things no longer as kind of divided, but, 
you know, because we tend to divide. It's either got to be science or it's got to be religion. It's got to be left. It's got to be I, th those kind of boundaries started falling down in my mind. And I started seeing, you know, everything interconnected and very intricately interconnected. And then that was reconfirmed by the genome project that National Geographic did, which basically sampled your mitochondrial DNA, so your mother's DNA. So through every human being in every tribe, all everybody can be linked back to one female in this same region of the world. So I found that just really fascinating to me that we have this sort of common, common origin, but it's kind of not known. Uh, so, so take all of that. Yeah. I, you know, I really wonder what people are thinking at this moment, thinking <laughs> that we were going to talk about broadleaf and now we're talking about mitochondrial DNA and yeah. uh, the Euphrates River. But yeah. what I want to know is then how does, how does all of that depth, right? Yeah. Um, connect to your work today. Like, how are you? How are you applying or inspired? How are you inspired by all of that, which is part of who you are? How does that come out in what you're doing today? I mean, I think that comes out definitely through you know all of Foundation brands because every one of Foundation brands is a reflection of kind of things that have had huge importance in my life or have affected my life and my way of thinking. So the tabernacle is definitely a reflection of, you know, everything I just described um, through a brand, you know, through imagery, through, um, and, and that's been great for me starting, you know, starting foundation is before I was strictly on the production side of things. So I wasn't involved in the branding, the marketing side, sales, distribution. So really to take blends you know, that I've been, been working on for so long and to complement those blends with things that really have depth and meaning in my life. Um, you know, that, that's just how I've been able to express them. Um, Cause I think and, in, in general today, the, the, the success of products, I don't care whether they're cigars or not. You've got this balance of the integrity of the products Right. It's got to be it's, there has to be a certain level of quality. There has to be a value for price, all of those things. Yeah. But then there has to be some authenticity, some authentic connection to the brand or not. But but there isn't a lot of in between. So you either have these these kind of, um, you know, brand only um, experiences or you have these richer, deeper brands that are connected to something else. And arguably some of those may have been deeper at one time and have since, you know, sort of uh, became larger and scaled up. And so I think you, you kind of have to lose those. Yeah. But, um, you know, I had no idea the connection of all of that, of all that stuff to um, your sort of reggae cultural thing. And actually funny, George Brightman just said, uh, how much do you think consumers are aware of brand inspirations? And, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting piece of the story that I yeah. think. So I sort of leave it because, again, like for the tabernacle, for example, whether people can take it to different levels, right? So there's, if they get into them more, um, sometimes, you know, the depths of the brands is a bit much. So, you, you know, I don't, I won't get too, too into it. I'll leave it yeah. to customers to sort of keep, get into it. And, um, you know, for example, like I just went to my room. So this is a book called, um, the history of the new, of the new world, Guillermo Benzoni. So he was a traveler in the 1500, 1560s. So this was another connect in my mind when I was developing like tabernacle, I was reading this book, excuse me. Um, so he describes going through Nicaragua. He was a map maker. So, and much of a, a traveler. What, like what year is this, you said? 1560, 1550s. So this is, you know, you're talking 60 years after Columbus discovered, you know, Hispaniola. And there is a, he describes going through Nicaragua and observing tobacco being used, right? 
as he describes it, he says, there's only two groups of people that use it, the indigenous populations and the Ethiopians that the Spanish brought from Africa. So when I read that, in my mind, okay, there's the link for me to say, okay, why am I going to use Haile Selassie, the last, the last emperor of Ethiopia? How does that connect to tobacco? Again, consumers might not know that, but at the same time, I think, you know, uh, because of the, the packaging or the design, they, some, they somehow connect to it maybe subconsciously or, you know, um, just the feel of it. And, and like so, you said, it's, it's authentic to me in my life. And I think that translates to people because it's real, you know, for me. So let's go all the way back. Yeah. 1996, you graduated, right? Mm -hmm. High school. So mm -hmm. if I asked you in the fall of 1995, yeah. what's your plan? Like, well, what do you want to be? What's, what's Nick Melillo going to be in 10 years? What did 17-year-old Nick Melillo say? I, I had no idea. All I knew is that I wanted to travel at that point. Like, I, I knew that was that plan I, A. Plan hence, A was find a yeah, way to travel. Find a way to travel. Hence, international business. I don't, you know, there's a lot of, I think, push to become a lawyer, maybe. Uh, my dad forced me to take Latin in high school with the hopes. I guess I had a good mouth at that time and I answered back a lot. So, um, but I knew, you know, travel definitely needed to be a part of that. So international business was the plan. And I knew I loved cigars and, uh, cigars by, you know, 96, I knew everything I could get a hold of or read or historically, you know, I, I loved the history of the indigenous tribes using tobacco. Everything about it was just, you know, at that time I was just all about it, man. I loved everything. And so what did you think as, as you were trying to map out like, okay, somehow I need to make a living here. What were the things that you imagined yourself doing professionally in as, as a senior in high school um, that, that you were going to apply? You know, this, when I was senior in high school, after I graduated that summer, I, my brother and I had walked into the cigar shop in June of 96. I didn't start working until August. My brother and I would go in there on Fridays and there'd be lines out the door. So I remember this one Friday, finally getting to the front of the line and cashing out. And I remember the two ladies behind the counter, Mary and Carol, they were running around, you know, they were just totally overwhelmed. And I said, listen, here's my number. Here's my, here's my email. I know everything in that humidor. I know all the prices. I know the blends. Um, if you guys need help, I would love to help you guys. So they didn't call me for months. And I was working grounds crew at my university, cutting lawns, taking out the garbage, you know, all that. So when I got that call to work at a cigar shop, that was like the dream come true. You know, it was like the ultimate job I could get. And then at that You were there how long, Nick? What, at the cigar Retail. shop? From 96 to, to 2000, and then a period there when I was working on my uh, master's degree for a little don't, while. Don't you think, I mean, I look back, I was strictly retail sales, right? Sales associate, really from, from 1999 till 2006, um, with a little extra responsibilities here and there. But generally speaking, the, the bulk of my work was engaging in the hand-to-hand -hand interactions with consumers. Yeah. That was it. And I look back at that time with, I mean, like profound nostalgia. Same. It was, it was, it was unbelievable. It's probably, it's the piece I missed the most. And it's why I, I like, I think doing all the events and stuff and the, the yeah. educational stuff. I mean, any way to interact because it's like every moment should be, it should be meaningful and memorable to the consumer. Yeah. At least that was my thinking. And 18, man, being so young and being able to be exposed to all these. And that's the unique thing about the cigar industry is you're meeting people from all different walks of life and experiences. So to be able to meet them and learn and hear stories and, you know, whatever it may be, um, 
I like, how, how many people lot. how many people ask you oh man you know i i would really love to get in, into the cigar business you know how how should i start what what can i do and i'm always like man you got to work retail yeah first that's i mean yeah. period definitely definitely it has to be yeah. right i think so i mean unless you're you know uh, unless you're yes yeah, still that's important because even if yeah. you come down here the, the dominican or honduras to understand the market is crucial. I don't um, care how much money you have or, or, you know, if you want to just start a business tomorrow, if you don't spend real time yeah. standing in a shop, engaging with customers, yeah. you, have, you have no idea the, the channels that these products are sold through, right? Yeah. I mean, if you don't understand totally. that piece, and I think it really tests your, your true passion for the industry, because let's face it, it can be taxing too. I, I mean, you know, but it's not easy, man. It's not easy. People think it's easy, but I mean, anybody that works retail knows it's it's a challenge. Sorry, my neighbor's dog seems to be choosing None. the time to act up. Good. They're, she's part of the show, too. What's the dog's name? Do you know? I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like she's being strangled down there, he or she. So last little dots connect here. Yeah. Where Where did the Renaissance art piece come in? Because I was so, thinking that was a pursuit. So it's interesting. So it just sort of, it's like a lot of these things, they weren't necessarily something like that I planned out. It's just things sort of started to happen and align for me in a lot of, a lot of respects. So um, interestingly enough, one of my best friends growing up, his name was Drew. Um, I knew him since, you know, 80, 88, still a good friend of mine. His name is Drew Kevorkian, not related to the doctor. Um, so he went to Dartmouth and studied Renaissance. Well, he might, he might be related if we track his DNA back to Ethiopia. <laughs> there is a solid chance that they are linked by the same woman. We're all connected. We're all Okay, connected. anyway, go ahead. That's a good point. That's, uh, he... He studied at Dartmouth Renaissance Art History. So after I came back traveling, I was working on my uh, master's. Um, he ended up calling me and said, a good friend of his from Dartmouth, she started an amazing tour um, called Italian Passage, which was a high school, which were a college level program for high school students from the States. So she lived in Italy for a long time, studied Renaissance, uh, graduated you know, at Dartmouth for Renaissance history and set up this tour from Siena to Florence to Rome for 15, 16 year old kids from the States. So she needed a chaperone and an assistant Italian teacher. He couldn't do it. So he said, hey, you gotta meet my friend, Nick. You know, he'd be perfect for the job. So I interviewed for that job and she ended up hiring me. And uh, I went from, you know, May to September about uh, on tours with, um, you know, high school kids from Siena to Florence to Rome. You know, Siena was the bareback horse race and the polio. I mean, she set up a tour that was just mind blowing. And that was what year? This was like, oh, one. Yeah. Oh, one. And then oh um, one oh two. And uh, it was kind of frustrating because the kids were the kids were rough, man. They were really privileged kids, and the the program was really advanced. I think for high school students, it was definitely like a graduate uh, college program. Yeah. And, uh, let me try to move over here and see if this dog does. Um, so, so yeah. So I was hired there, and then I said I can't possibly go back to to school and sit in a classroom after this tour. So, you know, I was getting paid, my room and board, my flights were all taken care of. So I was able to save money. And then at that point I said, after this program's over, I bought an around the world ticket for $1,500 off of a site called airtrex.com. And so after that job, I bought a ticket. It went from Paris to Mumbai, India Mumbai, India to Bangkok, and then how you made the ticket, if you added cities, you know, the price would go up. So I went into Bangkok, and then the, the only way to keep the price of the ticket around $1,500, the next flight out 
was Beijing, China. So I had to get overland from Bangkok over like a two month period of time to Beijing. It was like two, three months. And then from Beijing to uh, Japan and then Japan, San Francisco. And I didn't really have a flight after that or really a plan after that. Um, yeah. So, That's amazing. Yeah. So I did that at the Italian wow. Passage and then um, ended up going to France. I lived in the Buddhist community there for like uh, a month and then uh, flew to India. Uh, I ended up eloping on the beach in India. I never really got into that part. That was uh, another aspect of the journey. And, There's a Hurt um, exclusive. Yeah. So it was this time. So I had an email list going of guys from the cigar shop, um, guys that I had met along the way. So John Drew was one of those guys. So he was on this email list of, you know, me emerging from the jungles and going through Laos and Thailand. So I think at one point the light went off and said, all right, I, I mean, this guy's in Laos and Vietnam. I'm sure he'd come to Nicaragua and live in Nicaragua. So we sort of talked at the beginning of my trip, and then he basically said, hey, you know, when you're coming around the world, let's talk. And uh, I was in Japan, and he offered for me to come down to Nicaragua. And he is right here. So did you go from Japan to Nicaragua? So, no, I went, I went from Japan. I landed in San Francisco through Hawaii. I was in Hawaii for like a day. Landed in San Francisco the night before the Iraq war protests. So the next morning I land, the next morning there was like 200,000 people in the street and I was just trying to make my way through crowds to find a bookstore to learn something about Nicaragua. There was no Lonely Planets. There was, and I found right. a, book, a book called Moon Travel Guides, uh, which one of the authors was a, was a guy, Joshua Berman, who ends up later on becoming a good friend of mine. Um, but that was like my Bible you know, before and then living in Nicaragua, because the guy Joshua did Peace Corps in the 90s in Nicaragua. So it was more or less of a travel guide, but also living in Nicaragua. Um, so then San Francisco, I ended up taking a train to Denver, which was amazing. I mean, just if you ever do, it, it highly recommend it to go just go through the Rockies and the unbelievable. And then I flew to Connecticut sprung the news on all my family that I had just the So how long had it been since you saw your family? Now? No, no. How long had it been at that point when you went home, you show up in Connecticut, having gone around ten, the world. Ten months. Ten, ten months. months. Yeah. You land, you say, quick update, gang. I eloped and I'm moving to Esteli. Yeah. Yeah. And? Which at, at that point, they had sort of become accustomed to like me traveling because I had been gone for 10 months. You know, um, I think the worry kind of uh, yes. subsided, maybe not for my mother all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just sort of like, you know, at that point, it was like, he's going to kind of do his thing. And, and they knew I was passionate about it. And uh, of course, they were... Um, definitely a little nervous you know Nicaragua especially at that time you know had that mystique and kind of yeah, of course uh, yeah so um so yeah and then I flew down I was in the states for maybe a month a little less than a month and then I flew down to Nicaragua kind of understanding that I was going to be coming back but John was like you know if you want the job you got to start now um that was like after a week and then John bounced after a week, which kind of took me off guard. Cause I, I kind of had the impression that I was going to be, you know, I do this together for a while. Yeah. And he basically said, you'll figure it out. I mean, the, the, the company was a fraction of its size at that yeah, time. Of course it was. We were working at, uh, and know, he the, had, he had relocated and basically left everything for a pretty long period of time. So it was probably, he probably saw it as his, as his exit, right? I mean, it was a bit of a... Yeah, I mean, I remember his, his, his father's 
and his mother saying, you know, the best thing he ever did was, was hire me because he didn't have to be in Nicaragua all the time. And uh, I think I understand him more than ever now starting my own company. Yeah, the of importance of having, you know, someone, someone, someone down in Nicaragua. And then he was able to focus on, um, you know, the marketing, the distribution, the image of the company and, I was out to prove myself, you know, I was coming out of an international business degree, love cigars, you know, so it was a perfect combination for me just to go beast mode and, um, you know, start organizing things, quality control filters, you know, I knew what the product needed to be. Yeah. So then it was just sort of, you know, it was months, it was just pure observation, just, you know, <clears throat> what, I think is, what I think is so cool about your journey though and that's why i wanted to spend time on on the piece that i i feel like you probably talk about the least with people yeah um because the more like since i started this on literally on on wednesday talking to folks you know i've had my own kind of journey of i had a plan a and i knew what i wanted to do and if i look at where i am today you know i'm certainly not doing my plan a from an actual job description standpoint Although I think I'm doing a lot of what I thought I would be doing just differently, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's amazing how many, especially people in our industry, have sort of done this to kind of end up in this very perfect place. And especially right now, I think we're all paralyzed with this idea of uncertainty, like right now, right? And... Um, and and the the total lack of control over this virus, over our ability to go to work, to go to school, like all the stuff we kind of took for granted that, of course, we can do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now we can't do it. And, and there's a bit of this, like, mental, emotional scramble to, to, to figure out how to put these pieces together and do something else. Yeah. Right? Because it's not yeah. – we're not going to go back to exactly the same. Yeah, there's no. no way. Yeah. Um, and so what I think what why I wanted to dig in on some of that other stuff is to get a better sense of of really if if your plan A was kind of like this, just how how much of this you did kind of always intersecting with with um, the sort of plan A idea. But it seems like every time you kind of crossed back and touched the the cigar business you brought a little of this with it and that made you stronger in what you did and then that kind of moved you over here but then you landed back higher closer to plan a but differently a different guy different talent yeah totally. i think that's i think that's so important for people to to understand is that you know you're you don't you don't you didn't create foundation and run foundation and have all these awards and success because when you were 17, you said, you know, I've, I'm going to open up a cigar company and here's how I'm going to do it. First, I'm going to go to Europe and then I'm going to follow the Marlies around. Yeah. And I think if I do that, I should be able to work in Italy, touring some some spoiled kids around looking at art. And if that works out, then yeah. that should be able to get me on a worldwide ticket, which should land me at just the right time for John to call me and send me to Nicaragua. Like, that's not the way it works. Not at all. Not and at I, all. But it takes a certain amount of um, agility, right? Emotional agility. Yeah. To, to kind of look at the options and, and say, well, let me just take a shot. Like, yeah, that sounds, it sounds like an opportunity. Let's, let's see where it goes and then yeah. how I can steer it back yeah i mean all i was doing was just really just following what i was feeling passionate about at the time and then that sort of led me i was sort of living in a lot of uncertainty at that time because i didn't have travel plans i was backpacking you know so you sort of are just there is no set kind of exact plan and yeah. i think those at times that has the opportunity for again good things to happen. And, Some of the best uh, things happen yeah. that way. So I think this time that's going on right now, it's like, of course, we have no option. It's happening. But it forces you to, you know, not to be cliche or cheesy, but it does make you reflect on what's really important, what's real, and 
really what you need, you know? And, and you see that here in like Nicaragua, man, you know, like people live through tough stuff, you know, Nicaragua is, you know, I think has always been like seventh on the happiest list. And yeah. yet it's the second poorest in the Western hemisphere. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so it definitely makes you reflect on a lot of things and what's, what's really important. Um, and that life is present. I, I, I mean, precious. It, it really is. Um, yeah, man. So if cigars vanish tomorrow, yeah, what would you do? Uh, I'd probably, I'd probably move into like some Buddhist community or something like that and get to live out the rest of my days. <laughs> Peacefully thinking, meditating. Yeah, I got a place up here in the mountains here in Nicaragua. Um, no, I mean, like, with this new situation in the world, I don't, you know, I'm sort of going through it right now. It's like, you know, you definitely, uh, your mind starts spinning. Um, but I don't know. I, uh, you know, I would love, I love, like, history and 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 culture, I'd love to like really get into more like studying Ethiopian history. And like, you know, it depends on what, what, what the state of the world is, I guess. Um, yeah. But uh, that's definitely, you know, something I, I, I love. Um, music, I love, you know. That's my next question. If yeah. reggae disappeared. Yeah. It's impossible. What, what, if it's it did, what, what music do you think you could go to or listen to and find a similar... I'm telling you, the, or the foundation of reggae music is this, the heartbeat. So it's always, that, that's, what found, that's what really the roots of reggae is. So it, that's the foundation. If it, you know, reggae, you know, uh, you know, I love jazz. Jazz I love, you know, I was just watching the Miles Davis um, documentary right now. Um, Bro, he for me, I find more inspiration from Miles that I can apply to our business than almost anybody else. And I talk, I can't remember who I talked about it with, but it was on one of these conversations. Miles, for me, you know, when you think of how conventional he was and relevant in the moment, right, when he was playing with Coltrane, and yeah. then fast forward to the 80s when he's playing stadiums, doing electric music, and, and a lot of people said he sold out. But... He was, he still, I mean, you're, if you were blind and you hear that tone, it's miles. And he was able to stay so relevant. I mean, talk about, you know, here's your plan a and, and doing this and taking a little from here and a little from there. He was evolving, man. He was always evolving and he was always being creative and he was always, I mean, the music is just incredible because there's so much spot and spontaneity and creativity within it. I'm at the part where he's just getting into like the eighties. Yeah. Um. Yeah, incredible. You I have mean, to send me the name of that of that documentary. It's, just it. out in ne it's called Birth of the Cool. Oh, perfect. Yeah, but it's a real documentary. It's not the one it just with, came uh, out. I think with... it just came out. Yeah. Oh, I got on, on Netflix. Yeah, Birth of the Cool. That'll be a good quarantine show. Yeah, I got I got to do a big up to Jamaica right now. Jamaica's in the house. My man Marlon from from Kingston's in the house. What's up, Marlon? Yeah. Man, how cool, right? I mean, you're in Nicaragua. I'm in New Jersey. Jamaica's watching. We yeah. got people from Connecticut chiming in. I mean, we got all kinds of stuff in here. I'm sorry we didn't answer a bunch of questions, but... We got Nicaragua in the house. Nicaragua yeah. in the house. Indiana's on. Who else is on here? Um, people were asking about travel and all that stuff. Who financed your travel, all that kind of stuff. I think, actually, um, if, if you're asking that question, you, if you go back and start at the beginning... Um, of this conversation, hopefully a lot of that will be answered. Someone yeah. asked about um, uh, some of the interesting people who you met along the way. I think a lot of that uh, was answered here too. Columbia. So go back and, uh, in the house. San Diego's on. Oh, what's up, bro? Um, yeah, I traveled on. I traveled on like three thousand dollars around the globe. You know, if you're willing to travel, uh, you know. It's, it was youth hostels, it was camping, it was, you know, I was eating rice and beans and doing whatever it took to, like, to, you know, just experience, um, you know, each place. Um, yeah. I don't know if I could do that nowadays, but, um, you know, back then it was, 
it, it was all about just just doing it and for the experience so and uh, i think there's there's a lot to be learned you know as as you progress and you grow and you uh we get older we have more things we make more money um you know there's something to be said when we look back at our our simpler times yeah you know life is good right totally. i mean the the real the, the most important things we needed we had all the time all the time especially yeah. man yeah i provide well listen um we're getting close to an hour here so i want to be respectful of your time and i know uh for those of you who are watching or watch this shortly um you're going to be on with pierre a little later uh tomorrow tomorrow oh tomorrow yeah so tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. uh with pure trader who's a old friend of mine from boston yeah. and a uh, good buddy of yours too he's doing great things so i'm looking yeah. forward to watching you we, on there we met for the first time at nat sherman really you were here for his event i think that was the first oh, yeah. time we met yeah yeah it was either first or second time we met but uh Yeah, that was a good that was a good night too. That was a great night. Listen, we yeah. always have we always have great times together. And even though we're not doing this face to face with a glass of wine and uh and a warm embrace, this is a pretty solid next best. Totally. I appreciate you thinking moment. thinking of me. So and, be safe uh, in Nicaragua, man. Thanks we'll do. For, we'll do. Thanks for Which, the time catching up. Where are you over in Connecticut right now? Jersey. 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 Right, I'm going to go spend the weekend hanging out, quarantining. Good. Yeah. Hanging with the It's, family. I think I could finally maybe read a book or something like that. Good. Having I heard I heard you have one from 1558 that's supposed to be riveting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That should be a good read. Yeah, it never gets old even after 600 years or whatever. Yeah. I didn't do the math well, but <laughs> nice. <laughs> Nick, oh, I had one question for you. Yeah. Uh when was the last time you did not have a beard? Woo. 2000? 2000? It's been that long. Yeah, I think I trimmed it. I cut it once almost down, but it wasn't completely shaved one time. But yeah, 2000 is the first time I grew. My when I left to travel the first time was the first time I started growing it out. My other question was going to be I haven't seen you without a hat in probably 10 years, but Dude, I see you without I did, a hat. I did Rock this for you. I still got hair, man. It's this is unbelievable. Here. Yeah. I thought we I'd got, do that. We got some serious exclusives on this uh, conversation, bro. Yeah. It's it's really when I'm at home, I don't really wear my hat. Otherwise, I try to protect my dome piece when I go out, you know? Nice. Well, the dome yeah. is looking strong, bro. You still got all your turf. Well I done. Pretty, you got good coverage there, man. I'm jealous. Yeah, it's getting a little, getting a little thin on the crown. To be honest with you, I that's don't know I, about that. That's why I keep everything. You got a facing. long way to go. Let's see. Come on, it's not as bad as this over here. No, it's, I got the same one. <laughs> I got the same one. Look. Ah, oh, that's not bad. That's nothing. Yeah. Bro, this was great, man. All right, much love, man. Awesome it's, catching up. Appreciate you. Travel safe when you come back home. Give my love to Nicaragua. All right, same here. Hit me I'll up. I'll talk anytime. to you, man. All right, right on. Thank you.